Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our event uh, to launch a new report uh, published by the Centre for Cities and authored by Lord Sainsbury entitled Leveling Up the UK's Regional Economies, Increasing the UK's Economic Growth Rate. As many of you will know, Centre for Cities has argued consistently and I think convincingly that our cities and in particular our big city regions have to be at the heart of the leveling up agenda and that those cities need powerful and accountable leadership to turn the ambition of leveling up into a reality. And I think it's fair to say that if our big cities and their city regions don't prosper, our regions don't prosper and indeed the country doesn't prosper. So this raises challenges as well as opportunities around how policy gets developed and delivered. And in particular, it raises questions about what the role of for government, national and local, is in creating conditions to boost private sector investment and enterprise in more uh, in beyond in beyond places across the country. And we've got a great set of speakers to explore these issues and uh, many more. As always, before we begin, as always, before we begin, uh, the event is being recorded and will be made available along with the slides on our website after the event. During the event, please keep your microphones on mute unless you're speaking. If you want to tweet about the event, the hashtag is CFC Mayor. There will be opportunities, as always, to ask questions to the panel after they've made their opening remarks. You can submit your questions at any time. You don't have to wait until they've finished. And you can send your questions via the chat function to ask a, a question. When we get to questions, we'd like you to ask them, so be prepared. But if you prefer me to read them out, then just let us know when you post uh, your question. And we'll be done by 12 o'clock. So um, let's get going. Let me introduce my uh, my esteemed speakers. First speaker is Lord Sainsbury, founder of the Centre for Cities, amongst many other things, and author of the report we are launching and discussing today. Uh, Lord Sainsbury will be followed by Eleanor McGreeny, who is a senior analyst at the Centre for Cities. Our third speaker is Andy Street, who is the Mayor of West Midlands. And our final panellist is Dan Jarvis, who is the Mayor of Sheffield City Region. They'll each speak for a few minutes, setting out their views. And as I said, then we'll get into the questions. So without further ado, over to you, Lord Sainsbury. OK, uh, good morning. Um, it's been a, more than a year since the Prime Minister uh, won his majority on a pledge to level up the UK. Delivering this pledge has understandably uh, been delayed by the pandemic, uh, but now we have a roadmap out of lockdown. Uh, I think the Chancellor should show us his roadmap for levelling up. So far, it seems that the focus of the plan due to be announced in tomorrow's budget is based on moving government departments out of London, uh, the Treasury to the Northeast and housing communities and local government to Wolverhampton. Moving civil servants around like this uh, may have a symbolic importance, but it won't level up the country in the way that the government needs to by growing the number of high wage, high value added private sector jobs in the North and the Midlands. The UK has deep regional inequalities. Successive governments have sought to improve poorer regions prosperity uh, for over 90 years now, but have achieved very little. Most plans simply reinforce support for low wage, low value added jobs, which are vulnerable to foreign competition and technological change. What they did was simply to replace cotton mills with call centers and distribution sheds. In view of the government's commitment uh, to leveling up the regions of the country, and the fact that the Centre for Cities has done a large amount of work uh, on the economies of cities, I thought it would be valuable to put their research together with some relevant research done by the Centre for Science, Technology and Innovation at Cambridge University to produce an effective policy document. I think there are two reasons why previous attempts to level up the poorer regions of the country were ineffective. Firstly, they lacked a regional level of government to lead on regional generation. However, the creation of mayoral combined authorities now provides an opportunity to develop a new set of regional economic development policies to be delivered locally by them. And I think the government should seize this opportunity. Secondly, 
governments have failed to understand the reason why many cities in the north are poorer than many in the south. Much of the Industrial Revolution took place in the north, with many cities specializing in a single industry. As these industries faced competition from low wage firms in the developing world and their prosperity has declined, new high wage, high value added innovative firms grew up in the South. The experience of other countries should show the government that the only way they can level up the UK is by supporting the growth of existing or potential clusters of high value added businesses in the poorer regions of the country. If, however, the government is going to grow high wage, high value added businesses outside London, some important changes need to be made. The first change is to give the mayor, Metro mayors the clear responsibility for spatial planning and transport policies in their cities, bringing their powers in line with those already held by the mayor of London. This would be a significant change, but granting mayors of these powers would improve the management of our cities and create a much more favorable business environment. The second change would to be give mayors the power to align the courses run by FE colleges within their boundaries with the needs of industry. Currently FE funding rules means that to survive financially, many colleges must spend a great deal of time competing to attract students to courses that are cheap to run. By giving mayors the authority to coordinate the courses put on by FE and by incentivizing collaboration between colleges rather than competition, this could be stopped and the courses delivered could be brought in line with the needs of industry. Finally, for many historical reasons, the government R&D spending is heavily concentrated on centers of excellence in Southern England, London, Oxford, Cambridge. However, if the high value added private sector is to grow outside these cities, the chancellor must target more R&D funding at poorer regions. This should not be difficult to do as it can be achieved by strengthening and altering the recently in introduced Strength in Places Fund. Two projects it is currently supporting can be used to describe the contribution that the Strength in Places Fund is already making. The first is investing in South Wales in a coordinated package of technology, R&D and training to further integrate the region's science and technology base with its growing strengths in advanced compound semiconductor manufacturing. The second is to support is support for establishing a national center for excellence in Liverpool, focused on developing a progressive repository of methodologies, improved models for product development, for infectious disease prevention and treatment, and validated platforms for early stage product testing and evaluations. As well as devolving more power down, the government will also need to coordinate its own actions more effectively and make one government department the lead department for its leveling up agenda. Currently responsibility for, for it falls between several. I think it should also establish a national council for innovation, drawing expertise from business, science and industry to ensure that the regional economic growth program is closely connected with the other work of government on economic growth. The programme of reform which has been is proposed in this pamphlet is of course a radical one, but it should be remembered that regional inequality has proved an intractable problem in the past, and the price for success is enormous. If the country's underperforming cities close their output gap, the UK's economy would be nearly £70 billion larger. That's a target worth going for. And this pamphlet, I hope, gives a very clear indication of the kind of strategy we need to have in order to get there. Thank you very much. Lord Sainsbury, thank you very much indeed. So strengthen our, uh, our metropolitan, uh, our MCAs, our mayoral combined authorities, uh, coordinate government better, 
and target their creation of uh, high value added jobs that have bring benefits uh, to our areas across the country. So let's move on here from uh, Eleanor Magrini, who's going to give a little bit more detail on uh, the report, but also some reflections from uh, from our side as well. Eleanor, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Let me share my screen. Okay, there it is. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Lord Sainsbury, for this report. Uh, as you all, I'm sure, um, know, our mission at Centre for Cities is that to understand and improve the economic performance of the UK largest cities and towns, and hence levelling up uh, as a topic is very much closer to what we do. So uh, we very much welcome this uh, report, uh, and what I'm going to do now is uh, share some, of, some slides about uh, how we're thinking about these issues and how they relate to the report. First of all, the starting point of uh, um, Lord Sainsbury's report is that, uh, um, that of uh, regional inequalities. There are stark regional inequalities across the country and a clear north-south divide. When we dig deeper behind this headline, what we see is that uh, not only there are stark inequalities, but that this leveling up challenge is pretty much a city challenge. And what you can see on this graph is that if we look at urban and non-urban areas across the country, Non-urban areas outside the Greater Southeast and inside the Greater Southeast are pretty much at the same level of productivity, whereas the main difference is in the productivity of cities in the Greater Southeast, so a region comprising the southeast of uh, England, the east and London, compared to other urban areas. And these cities in the Greater Southeast are 47% more productive. So why is it that cities and in particular leveling up is a city challenge? Well, cities are the hub of the UK economy. They account for only less than 10% of the whole land mass in the UK, but they are home to over 50% of all businesses in the country and to over 60% of all jobs across the country. So they are very much where economic activity takes place. And yet, despite them being the hub of economic activity in the UK, what we can see is that their um, economic performance compared to other European large uh, cities uh, is very much uh, um, uh, less strong um, than what it could be. So what you can see on this map is that uh, um, a few cities in the UK are of a dark green color. So they have a very high G G GVA, very high productivity per worker. Uh, whereas uh, instead, uh, most of them are more in a yellow color, suggesting that they are underperforming compared to other um, cities in uh, Europe. And when we zoom into the UK, we can also see how this different plays out uh, within different cities. So if on one end we take a place like Reading, uh, its productivity per worker is much higher than what it is in uh, Bradford, for example. And this is not just an issue because of productivity and economic performance, but this has a knock-on effect on the opportunities for people that live in these areas. So the average weekly workplace earnings in uh, Reading are higher than those in Bradford, and economic opportunities, employment opportunities, are also better in Reading, where there are fewer people claiming unemployment-related benefits than in Bradford. Why do we see these differences? Well, as Lord Sainsbury uh, just uh, laid out right now, the main differences are related to the industrial structure of different places. And it's not just about the quantity of jobs that we see in different types of the, in different parts of the country, that matters in terms of determining their economic performance, but the quality. And the places that have more of this uh, private knowledge intensity, high value, high productivity business, the more productive these places are. And that's why we see differences between places like London or Reading or Milton Keynes on one end, and places like Mansfield or Stoke and Sheffield in the other end. So if we are to truly level up, we need to, to create uh, um, and to attract uh, to parts of the country that have fewer high value businesses, more of these jobs, more of these industries, so they can prosper as well. And this is not just something that is important for these places itself. This is important for towns around the city region and the wider areas as well. What you can see on this map is uh, the rela this relationship between cities and nearby towns. The largest, the largest square dots uh, represent the city productivity, whereas uh, instead uh, the smaller dots represent uh, towns unemployment. And what you can see is that uh, um, 
towns nearby more productive cities tend to have lower levels of unemployment. So leveling up the productivity of the largest cities is not just beneficial for the cities themselves, but for towns too. And uh, as Lord Sainsbury was just mentioning uh, a second ago, this is also important for the wider national economy and the size of the price is quite large. These are the cities that, um, according to our research, have the largest output gap compared to their European counterparts. And uh, um, if we, we, these are the top 10, but there are more of them. And if we add up all of them together, as Lord Sainsbury was just mentioning, the economy would be um, 70 billion uh, larger than what it currently is. So a big price. How do we get there? Well, we need to make sure that different places have more of these high skill and high value businesses. And uh, the mayor, mayor combined authority models presents a good opportunity, a unique opportunity to do this. We already have a number in place across the, the largest city regions across the country. And as we can see, they already have a number of powers uh, over uh, a number of different policy areas. But um, in line with some uh, research that we've done and published earlier last year, as well as the research provided by Lord Sainsbury uh, in this new report, we know that we need to go further and we need to make the most of this opportunity. And uh, how we can do that? Well, first of all, um, we need to ensure that this process of um, reorganization of local government is continued and completed to all other areas that there are city regions, for example, but don't have a mayoral combined authority model. Then, on top of that, we need to ensure that all the mayoral combined authorities have the same powers than uh, London. London has had a div uh, devolved organization for longer, and it has uh, different powers that other mayoral combined authorities don't have, and we need to level up uh, these differences. And on top of that, we also need to go further and, uh, um, the, and devolve further powers in terms of transport skills, spatial planning and R&D, as we were just mentioning earlier. And to do all of this, to, to wrap it up, we also need to ensure that not just the powers are devolved, but the right financial tools for local government to be able to successfully deliver on these areas. Because local government has two important roles, right? One is the leadership one, but at the same time, it's also about coordinating the activity of on these different policy areas. And that's only possible if there is the right financial uh, support there and all the right powers are devolved uh, um, at the same time. So that's it for uh, uh, how we think about it and really keen to hear from the Metro mayors now. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, um, Eleanor. So let's let's hear from our mayors uh, and let's go to uh, Mayor Andy Street first. Andy, over to you. Yes. Good morning, Andrew. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to do this. And uh, so first of all, I obviously would like to uh, thank Lord Sainsbury and the Centre for Cities for this report. And of course, to particularly welcome the focus that it brings to levelling up through strong, vibrant economic growth and, as you say, sustainable, high value, long term jobs. Now, I guess there's a serious risk of the four of us being in extreme agreement on this panel. So uh, I'd like to just pull out a few things I strongly agree with in the report, but then offer a little nudge at the end as to where I think it's missing a critical chapter. So. Uh, uh, the reason this is obviously so welcome is this speaks directly to the mission of the combined authorities from when they were created. And I was pleased that Elena just talked about the local industrial strategies, because my own view is that they have been the single most important piece of work which talk about how we are going to do what we are destined to do from our creation, because the local industrial strategies were all about raising our long term economic performance. And as Elena's chart just showed, we were one of the three trailblazing trail regions, and I still believe very strongly that although it might not be quite as um, sexy with the current government as the previous government, government it is absolutely the critical uh, thing that we have to deliver. In our case, what it did was it focused very clearly on the four big uh, opportunities where we thought we had a genuine international competitive advantage and it was all about getting behind those opportunities. And of course, the one that people understand most about the West Midlands 
is the automotive industry and particularly the electrification of that industry, uh, a task that we are seriously engaged upon and building. And it was interesting that your report on press release around it called this out, building an incredible international competitive cluster uh, based around Coventry, but serving the whole of the region. So it's a very practical example of exactly what you're talking about. The critical thing in our strategy was that it wasn't though just about the final output, it was very much about the supply side of our economy as well. Everything from transport to skills to housing, and of course, increasingly the importance of energy provision as well, all part of it. And pre-pandemic, we could probably argue that the West Midlands was making really good progress in pursuing our plan. Certainly the economic growth in the region over the five years pre-pandemic had been 25%, and we were just beginning to actually close, not broaden, our uh, uh, output gap to the national average. As other reports have shown though, actually the pandemic has been pretty tough on the West Midlands and the latest numbers show that that gap is broadening. So given that, it's why I particularly welcome what is being said and I agree with all of the points in the report, possibly not the strategic planning piece, but we won't dwell on that. But the point I want to make is that lots of the things that are talked about are probably what will be described as half devolved at the moment. So if you take 16 plus um, education, where I strongly agree with the report, we have funding for the adult education budget at the moment, but we don't control all funding for the FE sector, which we would like to see. If you look at transport, we're probably uh, next to London in terms of having most powers. And I think we've made a good job as using transport as a driver of economic activity. Lots of our investment is there but it certainly isn't complete the devolution. So if you look, for example, at the rail franchise, although it's set up to match the economic area, the travel to work area, we still don't have a full control over that. So I strongly agree with the call for full devolution rather than what you might call half devolution in some of those areas. And indeed R&D, the numbers are very telling. Just to give you the West Midlands comparison, for private sector R&D, pounds per head, we are actually top in the country, ahead of the areas in the Golden Triangle. And that talk, just talks to some of our industrial beasts. But we are bottom but one for public sector R&D. So the West Midlands, in a sense, is the perfect example of how the public sector is failing to support our private sector businesses in terms of driving innovation. But the bit of the report that I think is missing, if I may be so cheeky to say this, to uh, uh, Lord Sainsbury is the piece around what I would call financial devolution. Because uh, everything that we do uh, obviously requires on fund, re relies upon funding streams. And at the moment, those funding streams are still controlled by central government. You put in your chart, Elena, the 30 year funding settlement, 1.1 billion pounds over 30 years. Anyone will know that's welcome, but it's relatively small. The huge, and it is dwarfed by all of the funding decisions that are taken by the different departments of government and indeed, of course, by the private sector. And at the moment, what we basically have is a model by where in which the mayors ask government for investment into their regions. That is not full devolution. It doesn't give the control with the sort of brain of planning the local industrial strategies. So the big breakthrough for government is to genuinely move to a piece of financial devolution. And if you think of the taxes that I would be talking about there, it's not about increasing the tax burden on local citizens, it's about retaining taxes that are levied locally go into a national pot currently. So it would be airport passenger duty, vehicle excise duty, probably energy company obligations, a critical big tax that we're all paying straight into government, it's all leveled locally. It could be a proportion of stamp duty, it could be a proportion of VAT, like American cities have. And the idea is it would be held here we would have financial sustainability, but in exchange, government would say to us, well, Andy, you've got that, but you stop asking us for other things and a deal would be struck in that way. And then decisions would genuinely be taken here, not by Whitehall civil servants in terms of allocating that tax take that's actually taken in the region. Good model of that we already have is the 100% business rates retention. It's worked well. I would like to, see, like to see many more. So if I'm honest, Lord Sainsbury, I would like to have seen a bit more about that in the report. But other than that, I give my wholehearted support to what you have written. Thanks very much, Andrew. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. Already as you're speaking, we've had um, several questions on that on that vein in terms of the financial element, the devious way. We will definitely come back to that in Q and uh, Q and A. But let's hear from Dan. Dan Jarvis, uh, give us your thoughts on 
uh, this agenda and where the mayors fit. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to join you and I'm grateful to Lord Sainsbury for what is a very timely and powerful report. I think it makes some critical points about why we need regional development and how to get there in the process. And sorry, Andy, I think it exposes how unlikely that that is with the government's current approach. Because at the most basic level, regional development needs three things. The first is a plan, but not just any plan. To have a chance of success, it needs to be adapted to local conditions and needs and based on local knowledge and networks. A one size fits all approach or one which misses key parts of the problem will fail. The second thing you need, and this is absolutely critical, is leadership, but not just any leadership. In practice, to be effective and accountable, any plan needs to be locally led. As the report says, the regional MCAs are the natural vehicle for that. The report also identifies the overarching challenge that policy needs to address, the need to move on from the low pay, low skill, low innovation economy that filled the vacuum after the abandonment of our older industries. Growth clusters, often linked to local universities, are the most plausible path to that transition. We're fortunate here in South Yorkshire to have two fantastic institutions, such as the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre and the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, and a core of world-class businesses. We absolutely need to build on this foundation. Expanding the AMRC would be a good start, but we also need the means to support individual companies where that makes strategic sense. Of course, as the report rightly points out, that needs more than just direct investment. We need better railways, better buses, better broadband, better housing. We need an integrated skill strategy that supports the needs of business as well as individual aspirations. But here's where I think that the report has a gap because regional inequality in the UK extends not just to wages and productivity, but to health, educational attainment, air quality, and so on. Important as the economy is, we can't sit and wait for it to solve those issues. So leveling up is not just about businesses, it's about people and we need to invest in them now. All of this of course costs money. So the third thing we need for leveling up is resources, but not just any resources. To address our deep seated challenges, funding needs to be patient, long-term, reliable, and above all adequate to the transformative ambition we have set. So if that's what we need for leveling up, how does the government measure up? Well, let's look at what's happened to funding specifically targeted for regional development, like the old local growth fund. Comparisons are complicated, not least because of the government's habit of using cash supposedly earmarked for one program to fund another, as they've done with the leveling up fund. But the basic picture is clear it's not the major increase you might expect. In fact, it's a cut, a major one this year, but a significant fall even in the longer term. When challenged on this, the government says that we're ignoring billions in spending on the national infrastructure strategy. Some of that can indeed be counted as leveling up, but some of it shouldn't be. Much of the rest is spread around the whole country with no clear indication yet how much will actually reach the areas most in need. The result is that the sums involved, while not insignificant, are a lot less impressive than they look. So, any way you cut it, they're well short of the transformative long-term investment we need to see. But more to the point, this is not just about money. It's about control. And the government has a pattern of replacing broadly, if imperfectly devolved funds, like the LGF, with common pots like the Leveling Up Fund, which force local government to compete for restricted, short-term, often modest awards, with Whitehall deciding the winners. It's a model open to politicisation, as we saw with the Towns Fund, and subtly but deeply corrosive of local control and strategic planning. My combined authority in South Yorkshire has been quite successful at this game, but I can say just how distorting it is trying to shoehorn our priorities 
into short-term applications tailored for a ministerial eye. This is the model you choose if your first priority is photo ops in the north of, north of England, not actual progress. So the government is not allowing the regions to lead levelling up, but nor does it yet have a plan of its own. The levelling up fund and the like are scattershot blasts of funding, not a plan. The National Infrastructure Strategy offers one-size-fits-all interventions centrally decided according to central priorities. The government can't even say what levelling up actually means, what are the goals and how are they measured. So there we have it. This report has done an admirable job of setting out what is needed, but that's not what we're currently getting. No transformative funding, no detailed plan, no local control. Unless the government changes course, levelling up will remain as elusive as ever. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dan, and indeed to all of our uh, speakers. And we've had uh, in, 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 the things that you've said have been picked up and responded to by um, by questions in different ways around, you know, how serious do we think the government is? How, how indeed serious is any government? Because this is an agenda that's been around for an awful long time. Do we think we should have more confidence that this government is confident uh, is is committed to it more maybe than uh, others. I think there's a bunch of questions around the fiscal element, and I think I'll come back to that. Particularly, how it's a critical element of of devolution in the in the medium to, to longer term. Uh, I suppose a first set of questions, and maybe come to the two mayors first. So Andy, come back to you first. Uh, quite a few questions. People like Mark Pemberton or Jonathan Nunn and and others saying, you know, we, obviously we are rightly in the report we're talking about the differences between our places, you know, the differences between the West Midlands and uh, and Manchester or London, but obviously there's an awful lot of variety and variation within your patch as well as between your patch and another patch. So can you just say something about, you know, how that's that issue about within region, uh, within area variation is taken uh, taken on board with the, the proposals that you're, you know, you're putting forward? Yeah, with pleasure. So Andrew, I think the first thing to say, it's not quite a question to us, but it's important to draw out um, if you look at the data, there is one hell of a lot of similarity, for example, between the West Midlands and Greater Manchester as a whole. So uh, I do think there is a common purpose between the different um, uh, devolved areas of England, actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost identical, the West Midlands and uh, Greater Manchester data in all sorts of ways, yeah. even though actually the economic histories of the two places are quite different, actually. So there's a lot of common purpose. In terms of... You've just gone on to mute, Andy. I didn't touch anything, Andrew. It's the host <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> they obviously didn't agree with me. Uh, so, <laughs> OK, uh, so within the region, uh, the answer is uh, uh, relatively straightforward. This is a huge challenge because we actually have some of the most economically successful uh, uh, economies in the whole country, for example, Solihull, and we have some of the most um, uh, challenged areas like Sandwell. So the approach we've tried to take in our local industrial strategy is one, growing the total cake as quickly as possible. Uh, so what is in the total regional interest, but then every investment decision we take tries to look through the inclusive growth lens to look particularly at what we will do with the least advantaged areas of the region. So it's to try to balance those two pieces. Very good. Uh, and Dan, assume, assume, again, you know, your patch made up of different areas with different strengths and different challenges you know how do you bring that together in part i suppose is by operating at that at that city region scale and that in itself gives you an advantage right it, the scale definitely gives us an advantage um i think there are some parts of the country that have a long-standing tradition of cooperating and bringing the local um anchor institutions together with the local authorities to get things done i have this expression that devolution is a is a process not an event and I think the reality is that we're still, or we still should be seeking to nurture and develop the different arrangements they've got around the country. I think part of this is about funding. And I was kind of making the case earlier on for the government to invest more in our MCAs, because actually, I think that that will lead to better decision making and better value for money over the longer term. So partly this is about resource. But I think it's also a cultural issue. It's a mindset about letting go of power and control. 
And I think there was a very good reason to do that before we went into the pandemic. But the reality is that COVID is having a devastating economic impact on our country. But those areas that were more economically deprived when we went into the pandemic are being further leveled down. So I think the need to get this right and to invest in the structures of regional devolved um, institutions are even greater than ever they were. But that does require, as I say, this cultural mind shift to let power go. Because I think if you want to um, drive an economic recovery for the country, and if you certainly want to see um, the existing regional inequalities that we've all lived with for far too long be reduced, you're not going to do that from a desk in Whitehall. You're only going to do that by investing in those sub-regional institutions. And that requires ensuring that mayors are properly empowered, both with the resources and the powers they need to actually drive the transform transforming <laughs> change that, that we need to see. So I think it's a huge opportunity for the government here, but they've got to kind of reach out and embrace it. And I, I hope that they will. Okay, brilliant. Um, Lord Sainsbury, I want to come to you. And actually, I get a question from Ed Hicks. Ed, are you still on the call? If you are, can you ask your second question? Because it's about um, your, Lord Sainsbury's suggestions around how we modify the, the FE system. And I think that's one of the issues in education is how we bring our places together and make sure that you know everybody gets access to the opportunity. So, Ed, are you on the call still? Uh, yes, I am. Right, ask your second question, please, Ed. Yes, of course. So on Lord Sainsbury's point um, about FE uh, colleges, one of the uh, challenges has been the difference between what politicians often think young people should study and what they seem to want to study in and often end up doing. And I'm wondering, how do you think that politicians and policymakers can actually influence young people's uh, decision-making and particularly engaging with the variety of motives that they're they can often have, which often seem to go beyond uh, the purely economic. Perfect, brilliant. And Lord Sainsbury, I know you've uh, you, you've thought and written an awful lot about uh, these kind of issues. So over to you. Yes, I I think um, I actually have this a rather clear view about this, which is, I think um, clearly there is a very strong economic case for aligning the the courses run by FE with the needs of industry um, from, an in, from an economic point of view. I have to say, I think um, there's also a very strong case uh, from individuals' point of view uh, that the courses offered by FE colleges are ones that contribute uh, to people getting good jobs in the future. So I think having a lot of courses uh, which uh, may be attractive to people but will not get them good jobs in life is not a proper view for the educational system to be taking because it impinges very unfavorably on people's prospects. This, is, this has been, I think, a long issue in um, uh, British education, uh, but I think it's one we need to face up to. Uh, for example, we, we we give an enormous number of courses on hairdressing in this, this country. Far more, I mean, every year we, we give so many courses on hairdressing and we then far beyond anything we need because that it's kind of a nice thing to do if you're a young person. But they sh we should be treating people, giving people courses, offering courses to people which have a much better uh, opportunity to get, get them jobs because it's very unfair on them uh, to get them to do these courses and then put them on the labour market where these qualifications don't make any help them at all. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, complete. And Eleanor, the uh, the research, the analysis that we've looked at actually suggests or reinforces that point that where businesses are involved in the development of training and, and qualifications, actually you get better outcomes for the individuals that participate. Yes, exactly. And I mean, the FE white paper that has been published by the government uh, at the end of uh, January goes uh, somewhere in this direction, as in it puts uh, employers in the driving seat, which is good, um, but um, somewhat for um, 
split power even more when it comes to the local level in terms of who is responsible for a skill. As Lord Sainsbury calls in this report, there is an important economic argument for the mayoral combined authority to be in charge of this kind of coordinations between businesses and providers. And that's because they know better about the economic opportunities available in their weather area and the direction of travel that they want to bring their area into. Um, so it's something, it's good to see that employers are more involved, but it would be even better to uh, have uh, the mayoral combined authorities in the driving seat. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Andy, what, I mean, what more, you said you were in the halfway house, as it were, in terms of, and you mentioned skills. I mean, what more would you practically want and need in order to, you know, to make this recommendation a reality for, you know, for your area? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it's an area I strongly agree with the report. So let me explain what happens at the moment. Uh, the actual funding power we have, of course, is through the adult education budget, which has been fully devolved. And indeed, some other areas of uh, devolved funding. I'll give you another example. We're just setting up our sector based work academies. So the 20 colleges across the West Midlands come together in one group and actually agree with one person, our director of skills. Uh, what programs will be run for that new funding, for example. So there are some areas where we can actively influence the outcome of the colleges. And the sector-based work academies at the moment, they're all around the sectors of growth. So whether it be construction, digital, uh, health and social care, so we can directly influence. Uh, the other area we indirectly influence at the moment, coming back to the local industrial strategy, when that was produced, we talked about the growth areas in our economy and we talked about, therefore, the skills that would be required. And then we sat down with each college to look at their programme of provision and they have actively been tilted in response to that. So that is an indirect influence. I think it's been hugely beneficial and there is no question that we were making progress in terms of the qualification levels of our population up to level three recently. What we do not have, though, is we do not have the direct authority over the funding mechanisms for those colleges. So the next step would be exactly what the report describes. And that's why I say we're at halfway house because we've got some direct funding, we've got a hell of a lot of influence, a collaborative approach, but we haven't ultimately got the financial uh, lever yet. Great, brilliant. Okay, let's uh, lots to get through, but let, let's, Dan, I'll bring you in in a second. But um, I wanted to pick up on this question about you know, the deep the, the fiscal element to the to the agenda uh and you know maybe get people to say a little bit more about that but um tony travers uh obviously uh knows a lot about the fiscal issues and actually is one of those i think that understands local government finance there aren't many of them he is one of them tony if you're on the call can you just pop your question uh, into the panel and we'll we'll crack on yeah thanks andrew um my question is this, I mean, we all, again, as Andy Street wisely said, we're all kind of on the same side about these issues. But my sort of slightly bleak question is, why is it that successive governments are 100% resistant to fiscal or financial devolution? It seems to be an unbreakable, an unbreakable certainty in Whitehall. The devolution of financial or fiscal power can't be delivered. And as Andy Street says, without that, and actually Dan Jarvis generously talks about a scattergun blast. There are now dozens and dozens and dozens of pots of money that local authorities have to bid for in the matter of um, uh, levelling up and, I mean, a whole range of pots that it really, it's kind of slightly wasteful for councils to bid for. There's, there's so many of them and some of them are so small. So I suppose my question boils down to how could uh, the, the mayors of the combined authorities convince central government that it's in central government's interest to devolve some fiscal power. Very good question, Dan. Uh, I get get your view, and um, um, given that Lord Sainsbury was a former minister, maybe we'll get him to respond to how he would respond to in his ministerial days to give us more power, take power away from you. But Dan, over to you first. Well. It it is a good question, and it's a question that Andy Street, myself, and all of the other Metro mayors debate amongst ourselves <laughs> on a very regular basis. But we're waiting for a devolution white paper, which may or may not appear any time soon. I, I suspect we won't see it this side of local elections. And that's a potentially a very significant piece of, of legislation, which will mark the next step on the journey for devolution. I, I agreed with Tony's analysis before he uh, posed his question. 
And I think it was the point I was seeking to make earlier on about this cultural mind shift of not wanting to let go, not wanting to kind of con release control of the powers and, and the resources that are held centrally. I think we do have to look at this in the context of a debate about the longer term sustainability of the United Kingdom. We've got very important elections that will be taking place in Scotland in the next couple of months. And in the context of those elections, there's an ongoing discussion about the United Kingdom and Britain. And how about we rejuvenate the, the, the union? And I think a very important part of that is being able to demonstrate to people in the English regions that they are getting the sort of the same level of investment and are being afforded the same level of autonomy and control as is the case with the devolved nations. Now, we're some way away from that, but if you look at the relative size in population terms of Yorkshire and Humber, it's bigger than Scotland, twice that of Wales. And I do genuinely regularly get asked by constituents why this goes to Scotland and this goes to Wales, but none of it comes to Yorkshire. So I think the best way of persuading senior ministers, and by the way, of course, for the first time ever, we've got a prime minister who was a mayor. So hopefully he, he understands this. I think the best way is us being able to demonstrate and evidence the decision-making uh, success at a local level. And that point about the value that we add because of the local knowledge and the local understanding. We see the opportunities, we understand the challenges, and therefore you mo the more that national government can invest in those institutions, the better that will be for everybody. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Uh, Andy, your, your perspective on this, I mean, in a sense, you, you know, you touched on fiscal being, you know, a really important strand of the evolving DEVO debate, and yet governments of all persuasions, and not just, you know, the current uh, government is the current government, but previous, I think, have been in similar situations, a reluctance to get into these sorts of issues. Why is that? And how can we, how can we convince them to change their mind? I just slightly disagree with the premise of your question, Andrew, if you don't mind me saying. I think okay. the David Cameron government did get it, and I think they stepped uh, to an unprecedented degree with English devolution. Uh, I mean, uh, the local growth fund, the devolution settlements, they were all moved towards um, testing uh, genuine financial devolution rather than decentralisation. Um, now, I find this question really hard. Because three years ago, when I started on this journey, I genuinely believed we'd be further on than we are now. And I thought the answer would be demonstrate what you can do and then government will come behind you. Uh, but that has not yet proven the case. And I think that the whole pandemic um, uh, reaction to the pandemic of centralising has probably stepped this back considerably. But I do remain an optimist. Frankly, I wouldn't be standing for this job again if I wasn't an optimist. Uh, because I think the inescapable logic of this will come out, actually. When the government looks at its um, live land post-pandemic, it will say, just as Eleanor's charts reveal, we have got to do get a better performance out of our major urban centres outside London. What is the way of achieving that? And they will come to this conclusion. But uh, that's perhaps um, an article of faith, given the evidence that has been tabled this morning, which I don't disagree with but I still believe the inescapable logic of that will come through. And do you think that applies to the, to the fiscal element as well? Because in a sense, you, you, know, you talked rightly about you know, other aspects on the planning or transport or skills or uh, innovation. Do you, do you, are you confident on the fiscal side as you are on, on maybe some of the other aspects? I can't be confident, but I am absolutely, uh, because of the evidence, uh, but I, that's why I wanted to put it on the table in my opening remarks. I think it is a critical ingredient of this piece. And I do again think the illogicality of civil servants judging tiny investments by national scale, utterly irrelevant investments from Whitehall will dawn on people eventually. Very good, okay. Uh, Lord Sainsbury. Uh, your kind of view on, I suppose, on the fiscal question in general, but then also, you know, the, how do we convince, how does one convince governments to, to maybe make the decisions and actually encourage them to believe that and to see that it's in their interest to make those decisions? Uh, yeah, um, I, th I think one of the first things I learned when I was in um, government um, is to focus on what uh, you've got a reasonable chance of getting done 
in the in the near future and not spend too much time debating issues where you're not going to have any chance of success at all and i have to say my reading of the political scene at the moment is it's not even clear to me uh, the, the government really has a focus um, on the mayoral combined authorities as the real uh, foundation for getting the levelling up agenda right. So that the first thing is to concentrate on getting that as the top of their priority. Uh, all the things in this report are then things which very easily the government could do um, uh, right away, and I don't think um, they would have a particular uh, arguments against it. So this is a practical way uh, forward. The question of long term, uh, well, not long term, of devolution or fiscal devolution. Um, I'm not saying it's not um, important. I think it's very much more difficult to do and will take much longer. It's not a thing where you can just uh, wave a wand. Um, and it will happen overnight, whereas most of the things in the report can be done really quite quite easily. I also have to say, um, my reading of it, I don't see any particular um, enthusiasm, as I say, for it at the moment in the government. Uh, so we can debate it a lot, but um, that's it's not going to be something that I think is likely to happen um, anytime soon. The first thing is just to get the fundamental issue that the way of delivering the leveling up is through the mayoral combined authorities. And that what I think is a very sensible um, and practical uh, set of proposals to take that forward. The second issue which was raised, which is um, the devolution is not just about um, the economy, it's about health and a whole series of other issues. I totally take that point. Um, but but I think the first thing to get right is is the economy, and if you can get many more um, high value added, um, high wage jobs uh, into these areas, that will take you a long way down uh, this very important agenda. Very good. Okay, so let's just let's explore because we've had several questions on this as well. So let's explore this issue a little bit more, and again get your views on you know the extent to which we you think that. You know the arguments about why we ought to focus on our big urban areas why we ought to focus on the mcas as the kind of critical institutions to deliver this agenda Do you, are, are those arguments well made are they settled are they appreciated within within government dan because you know you, there is an awful lot of noise about we need you know we need to do everything everywhere and you know we can't be choosing or, or selecting areas to focus on or issues to to explore in in more detail so i i'm one i'm curious as to whether you think that our big urban areas has been critical to their to their patch and indeed the mcas is the critical institution is that a settled argument or not it's not a settled argument it's the argument that the metro mayors collectively are seeking to put to government um and i remember going back more than a year uh, quite a productive meeting with the prime minister where he explained that he'd been a mayor and he understands the benefit of, of engaging with mayors and the importance of the work that we do. But I think Andy Street made, made a really good point about the conduct of the, um, the management of the pandemic. You can agree or disagree with the way that it's been done nationally, but there has been a centralizing force at work uh, throughout the conduct and the response to, to, to the virus. Uh, and I think that that is, is not the direction that we need to ensure that the recovery effort goes down. I think it's also fair to say that there is a lack of enthusiasm at the most senior levels of government, by which I mean sat around the cabinet table, for devolution and for further devolving uh, powers and resources. If you go back a few years ago, and <laughs> you know people will understand I wasn't his greatest fan, but somebody like George Osborne did have the kind of sort of basis of an approach to unlocking the potential of the North. Go back further than that, you had kind of people like Michael Heseltine at the very centre of government, you know, driving forward the process of regional economic growth. I don't think that we have those champions at the highest levels of government, and I think that is a problem for us. So we'll continue to work cooperatively 
across party with the metro mayors to make that case to government. But the case is, is certainly far from one, I think. OK, Andy, your view on, you know, whether, you know, the importance of our big urban areas, not only to their own areas, but actually to the country at large and then the critical central role for NCAs. I mean, is that is a broad agreement now within government? Um, so this broad agreement between the mayors, as Dan said, I don't think there is necessarily broad agreement within government, being honest. Uh, but let's remember what drove all of this in the first place. It wasn't politics. It was economics. It was economic performance. And the reason why the urban areas and their hinterlands, being really clear, uh, are the right models is if you take the West Midlands case, it's about five million people in the total West Midlands, not all in the mayoral electoral area. And that gives a critical mass for the region to be competitive internationally, economically. That was the thinking that drove Michael Hesentine's report that uh, led to the whole uh, Cameron Osborne uh, devolution push. It was about what unit do you need to compete with? And an area of 5 million people as big as many European countries should be able to be sustainable in terms of its academia, its financial mechanisms, its specializations. And that was, that was the driving force. And I think actually that single point has somewhat been lost. And if I'm really honest, the politics are not helping us because the politics are talking about towns mm. and actually the Conservative Party's done very well in some smaller towns. It's still not done as well as it needs to do in the big urban areas, but you've got to come back to the logic of the economic competitive building block. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And Eleanor, very, very briefly, I mean, our work touches on, on these, these points around it. It's not part of the problem is that it's often seen as zero sum which it's not and actually as you said on one of the slides the size of the prize if we can get you know more economic activity out of our big urban areas is substantive but just say something on that and i'll give lord sainsbury the, uh, the final bit the final say yeah absolutely it's not just about cities becoming uh, stronger places and stronger economy there is a price for the national economy and also it's important to remember there's also a price for areas that are around the cities so it's not a zero-sum gain in between gifting to cities and uh, taking them away from towns it's uh, the, the two things are very much interlinked and improving the economic performance of cities does have a positive effect on nearby towns as well which is really important very good. Thank you very much. And Lord Sainsbury, final thought from you? Thanks for the mayors, because I think um, uh, they very much reinforce the central points we're making in this, in this report, which is uh, that the cities and their economic performance is absolutely vital in this levelling up agenda. Uh, and I think um, uh, they're agreeing with all the key points um, in the in the report, um, and I think uh, I've come back to the point I made just a minute ago. Uh, these are all things that the government could do really reasonably easily, um, uh, and if they were really determined to put the mayoral combined authorities at the at the centre of the levelling up agenda, and I think putting the mayoral combined authorities at the center of the leveling up agenda is absolutely key. Um, and I hope very much that the government takes this point on board because um, if we don't, if they don't take it on board, uh, then I think uh, we'll all be sitting here in 20 years time uh, having the same debate. Uh, and this debate has been going on now for 90, 90 years we've been trying to level up uh, the the poorer regions with very little success and I think the moment has come to do something and what's in this report is a perfectly practical important way of doing it and I hope that when we see the uh, deep the the leveling up document from the government uh, these sort of policies are, are at the heart of it. Very good thank you very much on that optimistic uh, note uh, it's 12 o'clock, so we need to uh, finish. Thank you all. Thank you to my um, brilliant panel, Lord Sainsbury, uh, Eleanor, Andy, and Dan. Thank you very much for being with us today, all of you. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining and uh, sending in your questions. We had lords and lords. I apologise we only got through um, some of them. Uh, as always, the, you'll find a, 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 the recording of the event, uh, Lord Sainsbury's report, and all our work on levelling up devolution and mayors on our website, centreforcities.org. 
Our next event is next week on the 9th of March. We're actually will be looking at some of how we maintain some of the, the better performance we've seen in some of our places now um, uh, in terms of how they've been hit by COVID. You can find more details on our website in relation to that. Hopefully see you at that on the 9th of March. But until the next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh,